vertex coloring. Let's talk vertex coloring. So I'm going to sort of blaze through this real quick. We have this thing that I've been creating called ship name. So it's BP underscore ship name colorable. And this is meant to support the player customization. So we have this ship. Which I'm going to keep it nearby. Yeah, something like that. Okay. Shadows are fun. I love that. All right. Now, in this, I actually spent the five minutes trying to find this. I was clicking on this top level blueprint here, and there's no properties exposed, but I forgot it's inside of the component, so you kind of have to look in this little guy here. So there's BP custom color component. Now, I've already mentioned briefly that I haven't yet updated. Let me find it. Here it is. I have not yet updated this preference color themes thing. So I'm working, well, I'm not working on that yet, but when we do get it, it'll make this a little bit better. But for now, we're still using our fixed color selection. Uh, so for example, let me make sure the material is already set. Actually, it is. I already know it's set. That's right. That's what the blueprint's for. So if we do red here, and then we just do update. All right. So let's break down what just happened. The first uh, color group, vertex color group, was uh, given this specific color. Um, so we have a, a shader that knows how to read the vertex data, and then it takes that and it can, you know, we can sit there and manipulate these colors to whatever. So it's got like you know its own unique blending system and stuff. All right, so let's let's break that down. Oh, I need to open up Houdini. Okay, here she is. This is the goose file for Houdini. So normally, the reason why I pass all of our process models through Houdini is um, is for this purpose here to like get the customization stuff. So you know, we've already talked at length about like the grouping and stuff. So we still we still want that, like we still want the grouping. Uh, and so I have these sections here for, for grouping all this stuff together for animation and for colors. So we'll, we're going to specifically hone in on colors, though. So the C1 group here, so if we like highlight this, and I'm pretty sure... All right, so what you're looking at is these selections of groups, which made it pretty easy. Like we basically just menu selected them. Like I want this to be in color group one. We don't know what the color is in the program. We just know that these are the same color. And that is half the battle. So we just get it in a group here. And we do the same for the next group. So this is a different one, which actually, hold, is that overlapping? It looks like it might be. Yeah, that one might cause a problem. See color group two there has, it looks like that's selected twice. So we'll see what happens there. And here's the third one. Here's the fourth one. Here's the fifth one. Looks like this model supports six colors. So we'll go in the program and color that. Um, but the first thing we do is we make those selections. And so uh, that's why we want the geometry to be broken up, which I know, you know you're calling it messy, but actually we kind of need that. It's, it's, not, it's not messy. It, if we're able to use it, I think it's worth the worth the challenge there. So you see like all these groups here. So what we do is we just take it and rename them. So like what is it over here? This must be the old and this might be the old file. I, I don't I didn't thought it, I thought it opened up the new one. So like for example, if we go up to here. So we go up to here, and then you can see like all these names. Where, where do they come from? There must be a rename somewhere that I'm not aware. Oh, here it is. Group rename. So yeah, here it is. The the renaming of things. So some of these, you know, they'll have these group renames. Is another one, and so like PQ58 
I think it just kind of came up with a naming convention that made sense, polysurface 36, et cetera. And you just kind of do that. So whenever you're first dealing with the geometry and you have all these names like this, this isn't too bad. Like, it's okay. Uh, I, like I, it might seem like overwhelming at first, but going through and naming all this stuff isn't terrible. Like it allows me to get familiar with the geometry. And um, we want it pieced out like this anyways to be able to color it. If it's not pieced out, then we can't color it with great detail. The colors would get really bland. So it's not it's not so bad. So um, if naming things slows you down, don't don't bother. Just we can name them later as a part of the coloring process and stuff. Just let the geo be split out. Sometimes it makes sense to combine geo, but if you forget, then better to leave it separate than to than to combine it aggressively, and then we lose the ability to to do this to do this color grouping. Okay, so once the color grouping is done. Uh, we want to, I have actually put this on GitHub, but there is, what you're looking at at the bottom left here is called the geometry spreadsheet, and, and you already know this, but I'll just mention, because this is a public video, so these dots here are little verts, and you can store data on each one of these dots. And so what we're looking at right here, and this little point sheet, is this is the X position, the Y position, the Z position, and then there's a bunch of other kinds of data. So there's UVs, which we don't really need UVs. Um, presently, we don't need UVs because we're not using decals yet. Uh, and then you see this here, CD underscore V, CD underscore V1, V2. This stands for RGB. And we can put data, uh, and these are called vertex colors. So we can put data inside of this and then use it later. So right now there's no data in there. And what we'll do is uh, this initializes that field. So it just sets it all to zeros. I, I found that if you don't do that in Houdini, it just doesn't work. So if we go back in time a little bit and we just click on the, the node before it, you'll see that it's not there. But you will see these groups. So it says group zero, like as in it's not in that group. But this one, this particular vert is in group four. One thing I've noticed though is that if you use these views for points and stuff, sometimes it glitches out, especially on complicated models, and then it won't go away. So I think that, that happened a second ago. I couldn't get it to stop. All right, the next step, so we initialize this um, vertex data. I'm just gonna move on. Trying to explain the, or show a correlation between this um, geometry sheet. But you can see this these zeros here. Now what we wanna do is encode the shader config into this. So uh, I'm passing in a normalized value. I'm pretty sure it needs to be normalized. And what that means is it needs to fit between zero and one. So there's a lot of things that do this. Um, you can only normalize a value when you know the minimum and the maximum. And so for colors, maybe I have Photoshop open. Uh, looks like I don't have Photoshop open. I have Unreal open though, let's, see, let's look at that. Let's go find a color. Is that shader? Just give me anything, yeah. So for color, if we crack one of these open, um, we know that zero through one is going to be, how do I change this? RGB values, here we go, yeah, RGB. So here's zero to one, but you may have also seen it as uh, zero to 255. So that's basically what we're doing here. So the 0 0.2, if we were to take that and multiply it times 0 0.2 and multiply it times 255, the maximum value, we get the actual uh, expanded value. So that's what we're doing here in Houdini is we're taking a value and we're encoding it into the shader config. So I have another drawing that I did which explains this too. Um, the code for this, it, it's in the Houdini file, but I also put it in GitHub, which is which this is a simplified version that's a little bit more generic and explains things. But effectively, we are taking the data and we're shoving it inside of the red channel. And so this allows us to store an ID. So we wanna just track, keep track of an ID in there to say, okay, um, this is value one, this is value two, this is value three, this is value four, this is value five, this is value six. And then what we get at the end is a vertex colored model. And so when we we write colors to this, it actually will show us and see what the heck is going on over here. Like, what is all that? Is it because of this? I want to stop. 
trying to select things. Okay, I think that was my problem. Just gotta like turn all this off. Okay, so now that when you see these red colors, that's because it's vertex colored. Uh, I had to do this too. Uh, so I had to move it from point to these vertices here because otherwise the exporter won't see it. So I think these points are specific to Houdini and then this is like modeling programs will understand this. It's essentially the same thing, but sometimes the, the attributes don't transfer for some reason, I don't know. Then we have a bunch of cleanup stuff, but that, that's not really relevant. Okay, so all right, you saw the colors, right? Now in Unreal, so we've already done all the export and all the busy work getting it into Unreal. And so now when we get into the game engine, we are able to manipulate all those things. So we know this one has six, so we can add, add six here. I'm just gonna kind of arbitrarily color these something. Just give it some value so that we have something to look at. Okay, there we go. So here's some wacky color scheme, but what you can see is like how we can easily customize all of this and we can control um, what the that vert looks like. There are limits to this method. Like you can't, you can't do anything with this. Like it relies really heavily on the geo. So a lot of times what people do is they actually shove this data into a texture, um, which could work better. Um, but I had issues with LODs and stuff, and it was kind of a pain to manage all the textures. So I found it much more enjoyable to just shove it into the, the model itself. And with Houdini, that was a piece of cake, but we did have this other process for putting in a texture. Let me find it here. I think it's called, yeah. See, you notice I did it with the swan, but it adds a lot of processing time. And so we had to create this thing called the top network to automate this. So you see all this here? All of this here was to create a texture using a tool called COPS. Um, and so we had gen generate unity texture and then like normal masks and all this junk. So like, you know, we're doing all this stuff to get a color map. Uh, is that right? Yeah, it is. It's doing the same thing. So you can see here where we're, we're compressing the value going to normalize. You see that number 255. So, and we're doing this for all these maps and which this worked, but you know, look how many textures it is to get all that data. And I found a way to just do it without all of the excess resources. Um, so we don't actually need this. We can just do it mathematically in the shader and just tell the shader through the vertex colors, what features are active and which are not. And that is much more, it's, it's better to work with. Like, uh, and I, I don't, in terms of efficiency, I don't know how much more efficient it is or not to sample a texture. I do know there's limits to texture sampling, uh, but it is kind of the de facto way that people tend to do things. What is going on here? Ugh, okay, let me pause. All right, just decided to save in the middle because I minimized it or something. Okay, so yeah, so basically with this, we can control this, but if we can control this, so can players. And that's the main reason I wanted to, to do this. Um, was to allow that just very seamless and easy control of the colors. And now, and doing this gives us the ability to uh, ironically rig it as well. So like when we have these groups figured out, then we can also control the rigging too. So we have different groups. We have one for color and we have one for rigging. And in Houdini, they make it trivial to just, you can reselect the same geo and assign it different groups. So you can have the same geo be a part of different groups. And then I, we have an algorithm that handles the vertex coloring. And then when it comes to the, uh, like the rigging part, we re, we use groups, but that we're using different, we use different groups. Let's see if I can, actually that's not what I want. Hold on, change it back to primitives here. I gotta change this selector guy. Yeah. So then these group names here correspond with different geo, um, and this looks really wacky. I don't know what's up. Yeah, there we go. So yeah, that's uh, grouping in Houdini is like everything. So if you're familiar with Photoshop, like selection is 
what is it? It's like 80% of the problem is like just making the right selection of pixels. And it's the same thing in Houdini, except now you're in 3D. And they don't show you this by default, this geometry spreadsheet. This should just always be open, but you have to open it yourself. Uh, but this here, these are your pixels. It's the the points here. But what's better about this program than others that at least I think is that you can see the data and you can troubleshoot. Like here I can see the name of the joints and stuff and like all of this, um, even if I don't fully understand like how this math works, I can see and troubleshoot these problems and then I can export some of these values that are that are well known, like vertex IDs and or the, the colors. So yeah, hopefully that helps in the journey of understanding vertex colors and how it translates all the way from the modeling program to the game and why it's okay to have um, just really fragmented geometry and the, like why we want this like these OBJ file exports with just the raw the raw geometry like that's that's really ideal. It allows us to get all these features and it's pretty quick to get in like to process one of these models is like maybe three hours. That's not bad. Um, not bad at all, but it does take some some practice and you you pretty much have to use Houdini like I don't think you can you maybe you can do this in another program um, but like you just you described like painting the vertex colors on I would not would not recommend oh um, would not recommend manually painting vertexes okay so limits of vertex data I drew this picture while I was um, troubled, greatly troubled. Um, I could not figure out, and I won't. I won't show. I, I I'd have to find the. I don't think I have the model anymore. That was messed up. But basically, uh, this explains the you know the color math here. So here's a normalized range of zero through one, and it's sideways, unfortunately. But hopefully, this still makes sense. Uh, Two fifty five being the maximum, and that would correlate to one in normalized form. And then in denormalized form, so you could multiply these this bottom value here by 255 to get these numbers here. And so these numbers here correlate to IDs. And so I just kind of arbitrarily colored these like rainbow. But this would be ID 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. Um, up to 8 is what we decided to support. But I think in the original version of this shader, um, it was like, uh, what was it? I don't know, some ridiculous number. Like we supported like a hundred and like ninety two or one hundred and eighty three, some very specific large number of colors. We don't need that. Okay, so how that translates? Like we've just talked about vertex colors, and we, we basically take one of these numbers and shove it inside of an individual point. So we take the smallest three D geometry, a triangle, right? And this is good interpolation support. Like it will color it correctly as expected. But if you have a triangle that has mixed numbers, then you end up with something like this. And I have to go into this whole deep explanation of how shaders work, fragment shaders specifically. Um, I will try to compress that down into like five seconds, which is to say that shaders automatically on your screen, what they do is when they see two verts, they automatically interpolate the value on one vert to another. So like the data is all numeric and most of it's in, uh, interpolates. So it's not always true, but in the case of vertex colors, it absolutely is true. So if you have something that's red and green or um, in a dramatic sense, one and eight in our, in our data over here, then it will blend in the middle to other colors. And this creates a horrible banding effect that is not desirable. It's very bad and it looks like garbage. Um, it looks like a glitch and yeah, it looks terrible. So this is bad interpolation. So that's a limit to this method is that if you're going to color vertex shaders and you're not using actual colors, but like in our case, there are IDs, then it's going to just do a really poor job, uh, converting that. And maybe that's why we had like 192 or something, uh, before was to like kind of circumvent this, but you know, trying to customize 192 colors for one ship took forever, uh, and it was not, it was a terrible experience. So I wouldn't recommend. Uh, so we have to make sure that the triangles are, uh, each each triangle is completely dedicated to one vertex color. So that happens pretty easily with group selections in Houdini, 
because that, that automatically is the case. But there are times whenever we'll manually select geo and create our own groups out of that, and that this is when this comes up. So when that happens, we just have to do something called vertex splitting, and then it'll there's even a node for that in Houdini, and it'll split out the specified geo into its own. It'll like basically duplicate the verts, and then we can uh, get away with that. So yeah, I finally figured this out after after a while, and uh, had discovered this was the problem. So we had two pieces of geometry, and one of them there was a shared vert, and needed to basically split this specific vertex. So I found the vertex, I did a vertex split, and then this triangle had its own dot, and this triangle had its own dot, and they were still in the same location, but there was two now, and that was which makes the file a tiny bit bigger, but totally worth it. So, oh yeah, here's the picture for vertex split. And uh, yeah, that's that's how we do vertex coloring and how it works. And this is very compressed tutorial. I watched um, I watched and read many, many hours worth of things, and I'm not doing it justice, but hopefully this helps in your journey.